My name is David Amadio, and I am a college professor, a job that I love very much, very much. I've been teaching for over two decades, and uh, my greatest joy still comes from interacting with students. Over the past few years, though, I've noticed something disturbing about their behavior. These days, when I walk into a classroom, a uh, classroom full of students, uh, I am not met with a hello or a good morning or even a bright set of welcoming eyes. More often, what I'm met with is silence. In that pre-symbolic time before the teaching begins, my students are not talking to me and they are not talking to each other. The reason for this, they're all looking down at their smartphones, eyes glazed over, faces expressionless. They usually don't snap out of this trance until after I've told them to put away their phones, which they do with the reluctance of someone about to tear off a Band-Aid. <laughs> now, in addition to being a professor, I'm also a husband and father. Uh, as much as I love being around my wife and two children, over the past few years, I've noticed something disturbing about their behavior. These days, when I walk into the living room after a long day at work, <clears throat> I am not met with a hello, daddy, or a how was your day, or even a bright set of welcoming eyes. More often, what I'm met with is silence. My wife, my daughter, my son, they're all looking down at their devices, and no one is looking at me. It creates the sensation of observing them from behind a two-way mirror as if I'm a behavioral psychologist and they're my test subjects. I sit down on the couch, I put my hands on my knees, and I wait for my family to talk to me. Either I'm the most ignored man in America or something is very wrong here. Now, when I complain about what the culture of constant distraction is doing to the fabric of human society, those who haven't left the room, uh, they tell me that this is the future. This is technological advancement. This is progress. Well, let me tell you what the poet E.E. E. Cummings had to say about progress. Progress, he said, is a comfortable disease. We don't know we're suffering from it because it feels so good to be sick. Now, in 2018, the Guardian Simon Parkin, he reported that app and social media designers use persuasive technology to build habitual behavior in smartphone users by rewarding them for repeating the same actions over and over again. Now, when you post a picture to Instagram, you may not see you know, any likes the first four times you check it. It's not because you're unpopular, you're very popular. Um, it's because Instagram's algorithm follows a variable reward schedule, waiting, waiting until maybe the fifth time or the sixth time you check your post to hit you with the likes it's been secretly stashing. Now, slot machines run on a similar system, and the brain chemical being released each time the gambler pulls the lever is the same brain chemical being released each time you check your phone and that is dopamine, the miracle bestower of happiness. Stimulating your pleasure center with text messages, notifications, videos, games, that smartphone is a dope dealer in the palm of your hand and you are fast becoming addicted to what the candy man is pumping out. You have contracted a comfortable disease, but not an incurable one. Junkies of the digital age, I have found your methadone. For those of you who have never seen one of these before, it is a flip phone. <laughs> it is my flip phone. Now, reactions tend to vary when I bust out old Flip Wilson. <laughs> some people in the crowd might know who Flip Wilson actually is. <laughs> um, some people, they don't believe that it's real. So I have to prove to them in a quick demonstration that this phone is in fact not a toy. 
Some people, they get very angry with me and they demand that I drive to the nearest Apple store and upgrade immediately. Other people, they just pity me like they would a stray puppy. Just this past fall, a tender-hearted student offered to raise money on my behalf so that I could finally, after all these years, purchase a smartphone. Now, whether it's uh, you know, disbelief, resentment, compassion, these, these knee-jerk responses, they rarely allow people to stretch their thinking beyond the visible. You know, for them, my flip phone will always be an object of amusement. But for me, it represents a philosophy deeply rooted in who I am and what I believe and how I think and feel. You know, because I refuse to upgrade, people have accused me of being a Luddite, a curmudgeon, a sucker for nostalgia. But I am none of those things. What I am is a time traveler. And I come from the year 2006, the year before the iPhone first hit the market, and I bring with me a message of hope. For those of you who fear a future in which our species has evolved into a goggle-eyed techie with grossly oversized thumbs and a permanently forward-bending neck, join me in declaring the tenets of the flip phone manifesto. Number one. Defend the imagination at all costs. Now, the imagination, according to the writer John Dufresne, is the faculty that enables us to dream, to fantasize, to remember, to see right here in front of our eyes that which is not actually present. Now, in television commercials, smartphones are often advertised as facilitators of imagination. We see them being used to uh, paint pictures and record music, design blueprints, shoot movies. But in reality, the smartphone tends to prevent imagination rather than foster it, erecting a wall between our inner and outer lives. How are we supposed to imagine anything ourselves if we're habitually consuming the products of someone else's imagination? And how are we supposed to see that which is not actually present if we are continually staring at a screen that never goes away? Quite plainly, we are not expected to do these things, and this throws serious doubt on the future of creativity. Now, for as long as I've had this phone, and I've only had it since 2016, before that, I didn't even have this. For as long as I've had it, it has never attempted to kidnap my fantasy. It has never uh, tried to wake me from creativity's dream. It understands, as I do, that the imagination is the single most important faculty that we possess. It's what separates us from the beasts, and any threat to it should be regarded as a threat to our essential humanity. If the imagination is to survive this current barrage of nonstop interruptions, then somebody's going to have to stand up and defend it. Someone's going to have to flip out. I don't mind being that somebody, but I do mind being the only one. It's kind of lonely. Number two, make reality the default setting. Now, I consider myself a resident of reality who takes occasional trips to cyberspace, whereas a large majority of smartphone users, they are residents of cyberspace who take occasional trips to reality. Observing this latter phenomenon in my own children, I often wonder why reality gets such a bad rap. It's as if the very act of being has become a joke, or worse, a red flag. We see somebody sitting in contemplative silence on a park bench, and we deem their behavior suspicious. We say, look at that man, honey. He's just staring at the trees. <laughs> I know, I know, he's probably plotting something. Something terrible, yes. Call the police. We might all be in danger. Yes. But when the police show up to arrest this weirdo, they don't find a gun in his coat pocket. What do they find? They find a flip phone. And they stand there scratching their heads, asking themselves, who is this that has not yet bitten of the apple? He, like me, uh, has chosen to make reality the default setting. 
we, uh, we take life as it comes. We drink in whatever it has to offer from the average to the awesome, the mundane to the marvelous. We are content with our garden. And it's the flip phone that makes this possible. It does not wish to lure us away from reality. It stays on the margin so that we can occupy the center. Yes, the center. We stay in the center. Rather than give us, or rather than take us out of the received world, it gives us back to the received world, where all of us should be spending the better part of our days. Number three, live life at a natural pace. Now, self-control, the ability to command one's actions and desires, is a trait to which many of us aspire. Now, when you invite a smartphone into your life, you surrender some of that control. You give the machine permission to direct and modify your behavior. Now, connectivity is all well and good, but we are not meant to be everywhere at once. We are not meant to be everyone to everybody every moment of the day. At some point, you have to return to yourself. At some point, you have to come home to the natural rhythms of the brain and body. Now, because my flip phone does not have a competing agenda, because my flip phone does not have an agenda at all, I am able to live my life attuned to these rhythms. Now, some people say, Amadio, you are slow. I would say that I am sane, okay? Uh, <laughs> I am sane. And, you know, may, I may not appear as busy as everybody else, but when I do set out to accomplish a task, I perform it completely monogamously, okay? Uh, and I work at a pace that I alone have established, and I alone have the power to change. The start and stop tempo dictated by the smartphone is Always in, has always struck me as inherently manic. You know, I go mad just watching people hock off their attention left and right, worrying whether they, you know, whether, where, worrying that they're, they're never going to get it back and wondering whether, you know, they even care that it's gone. Number four, get your dopamine in the raw. Now, face-to-face -face encounters, whether on purpose or by accident, they uh, renew our membership in the human community. You know, we meet somebody for the first time. Uh, we, uh, we get to know better a casual acquaintance. Uh, we have a long conversation with an old friend. We walk away from these experiences feeling like we're part of something larger. Now, granted, it's a lot easier to post a picture of yourself on social media than it is to talk to a stranger at Staples. But the release of dopamine that you get from the in-person encounter is far more invigorating than the one you get from your phone. I would know I talked to a stranger at Staples not too long ago. <laughs> what began as a simple conversation about binders turned into a spontaneous exchange with a nice woman named Jen. Now, the social stimulation that I received from that conversation was enough to last me the rest of the week, maybe even the rest of the month. You see, dopamine isn't a bad thing when you're not chasing after it all the time. When it's real, when it's random, the effect will be pure and it will stay with you. But that may never happen. You may never become a true social being. You may never even learn what it means to be fully human if you continue to choose the world that wants to be over the world that is. Number five. Fifth and final, stop the conjuring of false spectacles. Now, before the advent of the smartphone, we determined the value of a personal experience by measuring its impact on our individual growth and development. Now, with social media playing such an important role in our lives, we measure the value of a personal experience, not in terms of its transformative potential, but the degree to which it can be recorded, shared, posted, liked. Now, this affects not only how we judge an experience, but how we carry it out, how we have it, so to speak. Even the most amateur smartphone user is a grand illusionist, conjuring false spectacles by turning insignificant moments into photo ops and pseudo events. One of my students recently said to me, Amadio, I don't think I know how to have an experience. And I said, you do know how to have an experience, but because you're addicted to watching other people's false spectacles, you're either, one, afraid that your experiences won't be as entertaining, or two, you are so amused by their so-called experiences that you would rather keep watching than go out and have your own. 
whatever the reason, the result is paralysis. Now, I am happy to report that I do not suffer from the same paralysis. I am an active producer of my own authentic experiences rather than a passive consumer of other people's increasingly artificial ones. I possess a device that does not help me to create, transmit, validate, or define my experiences. And after I have had them, I feel no pressure to instantly turn them into something consumable. It is left to me to determine their worth. And it may be years before I understand what they truly mean. But I welcome that burden. And so should you. Even if it means waiting to share an experience until after you yourself have liked, you yourself have loved, you yourself have commented. So these are the five principles of the flip phone manifesto. Now, <clears throat> written by somebody who does not own a smartphone and most likely never will. Now, hearing me say that, you must assume that I hate smartphones. You probably think that if you and I talk after the event, I'm going to smash yours with a hammer <laughs> that I keep in my back pocket just for that occasion. No, that's not the truth. I don't hate smartphones. I just passionately dislike what we have allowed them to do to us. The point of my being here is not to accuse you of anything or to make you feel bad or to vilify your technology. I am here to draw your attention to an issue that I feel is no less important than climate change, no less important than the degradation of our physical environment. Like the black rhino, the imagination is an endangered species. Like the tropical rainforests of Borneo, reality is shrinking at an alarming rate. And like the great ice shelf, society is fracturing in small, yet I fear irreversible ways. If you want to save these things, if you want to reduce the size of your digital footprint, then step out of your Cadillac Escalade and into my electric car. <laughs> it may not do much for your image, but it can do wonders for your conscience. Honestly, though, I don't think anybody's going to leave here today and exchange their smartphone for a flip phone. I'm even prepared to concede that my manifesto is absurd. Most good manifestos are. But nevertheless, I hold out a vision of the future. I foresee a time when people turn away from the Internet, when they wake as if from a long, bad dream and open their eyes to the world that I've been making ready for them. And when this happens, they will no longer be the ones to stand incredulous before me. They will no longer be the ones to pity me. They will be the ones to break the silence of those lonely rooms. They will be the ones to look up and say, I flip, therefore I am. Thank you.